Hello everyone and welcome back to another video. Now some of you may be aware but a new species of tarantula has recently been discovered and that is what this video is going to be all about. And you probably would have known that already seeing as it's written in my title but I might as well just say it again. So without further ado let's get started. Now this tarantula species which I have illustrated here using a combination of watercolour and pencil is a species that has been called Taxinus bambus, also known as the bamboo tarantula because of its very unique ecology which I'll be getting into later. And here is a quick overview of the animal's taxonomic classification. Now I'm not going to go into every single one of these ranks because that's not what this video is about but I'll mention a couple of key ones. The Opisthothele are a suborder of spiders that includes the ones with spinnerets at the rear end of their abdomen. So you can see them. I can't see my mouse. <laughs> All right, I was gonna use my mouse to show where everything is, but that's not gonna work. Anyway, you can see the spinnerets pointing out at the rear end of the spider's abdomen. The infraorder is the Mygalomorphi. The Mygalomorphi are the more basal of the Opisthothele, meaning that they retain more ancestral traits. In simple terms, they're the more primitive of the Opisthothele. Among their more notable features is the orientation of their fangs. They are held parallel to one another and when the spider bites, they strike downwards. This is in contrast to the fangs of the more derived Araniomorphi, which point inwards towards one another like a pair of pincers. It belongs to a family known as the Theraphosidae, or colloquially as tarantulas. The tarantulas are the most familiar of all the mygalomorphs, most likely due to their popularity as pets, and they are also the most diverse in terms of species count. This tarantula was actually discovered by a wildlife YouTuber, so waiting for my time to shine. And this is his channel, Jojo Sipawat. I, I really hope I pronounced that name right, and if I didn't, look. I'm only able to pronounce simple names like Parapropalia hoplophorus septentrionalis. Anyway, so yeah, he found the tarantula fairly close to his home in the Tuk province of Thailand. And here he is on the left with a team of arachnologists that are out in the field. And I'm not going to bother trying to read their names because it's probably just going to sound quite racist to be honest. Anyway, moving on. So here's a couple photos of the tarantula and honestly it is quite a cool looking species. I really like the pale bands on the legs and those red hairs on the abdomen that become especially dense towards the rear are quite a nice touch and look at me talking about a tarantula like it's an artwork. And I mean, I guess it is, it's, a, it's an artwork of nature. And here is a photo of the habitat from which the tarantulas come. High altitude, moist and luxuriant. Here on this map, you can see the location from which Taxinus bambus was collected. It's right up at the top left. All the rest are an assortment of closely related species. Taxinus bambus was found to belong to a subfamily known as the Ornithotoninae. These are a fairly diverse subfamily of tarantulas that are quite widespread throughout Asia. They vary somewhat in habitat as well. Some are terrestrial animals that live in fairly deep burrows on the ground. These especially are commonly known as earth tiger tarantulas. Other members of this subfamily are arboreal, meaning they live in trees. Ornithotoninae, along with Asian tarantulas in general for that matter, are quite fast moving, often rather defensive, and are armed with a pretty powerful venom. It's not life threatening, no tarantula's bite is to be honest, but it's not going to be a very enjoyable experience to say the least. Within this subfamily are multiple genera. Among these are Cytharonathus, Cyriopagopus, Lamprapelma, Melonathus, Omothymus, Ornithotonus, Formingochilus, and of course the newest member, Taxinus, which currently only contains the species Taxinus bambus. When Taxinus bambus was being described, specimens of other species 
all members of the Ornithotoninae, so close relatives of Taxinus bandus, were examined. These included a couple of undescribed species from the genus Omothymus, Syriopagopus albostriatus. Albostriatus, I believe, means white stripe or white line, which would refer to the distinctive patterning on the animal's legs. Syriopagopus minax, which is a fairly plain looking black tarantula, but still a lot cooler than any of the ones we have in Australia, to say the least. And then Syriopagopus lividus, which is possibly the most well-known member of its genus, and looking at that striking coloration, I'm sure you can see why. It is commonly known as the cobalt blue tarantula for pretty self-explanatory reasons. And when I first got into tarantulas, it was actually one of the first species I wanted before I realised that A, Australians are only allowed to keep native species, and B, Syriopagopus lividus, or Asian tarantulas as a whole, are definitely not suitable for a beginner. Anyway, moving on from that tangent. Syriopagopus longipes, which is also a pretty nicely patterned species too. Ornithotonus oreotibialis, which is a species I have never heard of until making this video, but my god, it's one of my favourite tarantulas now. And Ornithotonus costalis. Now, when a new species is being described, we write a description. Uh, yeah, I didn't think that one through, did I? When a new species is being described, we write a description. No shit. Anyway, moving on from that little flub. When describing a new species, it is of course important to measure the animal's traits, so that we know what to use to identify the species and distinguish it from its relatives. Here, this is detailed fairly well in the materials and methods section of the report that covers the description of the species. What I highlighted in yellow is where the authors go over the features that they are measuring. So, the body length, the proportions of the legs, etc and the green indicates where they mention what they used in order to gain their measurements. So this is all in all a very well written materials and methods section. It's always said that the materials and methods should contain sufficient detail that anyone intending to replicate this experiment would be able to do so without having to fill in any gaps. And I know I sound like a high school science teacher marking someone's assignment, but so be it. When we're describing a species, we have type specimens. Type specimens are those upon which the description of the species is based. The hollow type often represents a single designated specimen, and it is sometimes accompanied by one or multiple paratypes. Here we can see a description of the hollow type, which is a male specimen. The measurements of various body parts are provided. They're all abbreviated, but the materials and methods section elaborates on what each of those abbreviations stands for. So again, this is actually a very well-written report. Okay, you're not a teacher, stop talking like a teacher. Right. It also includes a series of illustrations of the holotype specimen, and this table at the bottom is a quick summary of the measurements of the legs and palps. Now along the top, each heading represents a particular appendage. The numbers 1, 2, 3 and 4 denote the spider's leg pairs, with number 1 being the foremost leg pair and number 4 being the rearmost. Palp is short for palpatine, just kidding, it's, well, the palp. The pedipalps are a pair of small leg-like appendages that are located in front of the first pair of legs but behind the chelicerae. Now, a similar description was written for each of the paratype specimens as well, but I didn't include those because it would have been basically the same thing, just with different measurements. Then we have the species description. Unlike the last two descriptions we looked at, the species description does not concern single specimens. It describes the features of the species as a whole. And if you look closely, you can see that most of the values being provided here represent a range as opposed to single numbers, because the species description includes the range of measurements across all known specimens. And that's very handy to know because there's always some level of variation between individuals of a given species. And understanding the extent to which conspecifics may vary is quite important because otherwise it can be rather hard to tell whether two individuals may represent distinct species or just variants of a single species. 
Now there was also a section on comparative morphology where they compared the physical traits of Taxinus bambus to a few other arboreal tarantulas all from the Ornithotonidae. One of the traits that they were focusing quite heavily on was the difference in length between the first pair of legs and the fourth pair. Species on the left hand side of this graph highlighted in red are the ones where the fourth pair of legs are longer than the first pair, whereas the opposite applies for those on the right highlighted in blue. And then there's species in the middle, like that one, yeah, I, I, will, I will admit that name has got me defeated. Penelhulterum, pen, penel, 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 yeah, that is embarrassing, <laughs> very embarrassing for me. And as you can see, Taxinus bambus is quite distinct from the rest of the arboreal Ornithotonidae. So morphology does suggest that this is indeed a new species. There were other physical traits examined as well, such as the palp morphology, but the main focus was on the relative leg lengths. And in case you're a little bit confused, here is the first pair of legs, and here is the fourth. So already it is pretty clear that Taxinus bambus is quite a unique tarantula, but I haven't really touched on what is perhaps its most distinctive aspect, and that is its habitat. Taxinus bambus is currently the only known tarantula that lives in bamboo stems. Here is a picture of the species biotope. Now a biotope is a geographical area that contains a uniform distribution of environmental conditions and species composition. So in other words, it is an area that can be associated with a particular environmental and ecological composition. And the biotope for Taxinus bambus is of course a bamboo forest. Here we have an image of the tarantula's home site, all snug inside its bamboo stem. Well, until it was presumably hacked right open. Well, things you gotta do for science, am I right? And there are a number of benefits for living in bamboo. First things first, there doesn't have to be much excavation done because bamboo is naturally hollow. And it is quite common for bamboo stems to have various cracks and openings in them, sometimes as a result of damage inflicted by animals or fungal decay, or even abiotic factors such as changes in humidity, which the tarantulas can take full advantage of to give them access to the interior of the stem. And here we have an image of one of these incredibly unique tarantulas inside its web, and it appears to have a bit of company there, I'm not entirely sure what that small insect is. Something that'll probably be dead soon if it stays in there too long. This is the female paratype, and she appears to be in captivity at the moment. I can see what looks like the edge of the enclosure, as well as some sphagnum moss underneath her. Now there are other benefits to these tarantulas' unique lifestyles as well. Tarantulas are formidable spiders, higher up on the food chain than pretty much any other spider could ever dream of. But they definitely don't have it all their own way, and Thailand, or tropical Asia in general to be honest, is full of large bugs that would make the ones here in Australia crap their pants. For instance, and a very specific example, this is a Scolopendra de Hanai, a very large and highly venomous centipede species that is quite widespread and common in Asia. And this particular individual was found inside the burrow of a tarantula in Thailand. And the fact that the burrow was empty and the centipede looks exceptionally plump and well fed means that you don't exactly have to be Sherlock Holmes to figure out what happened. But centipedes, and indeed many animals that may otherwise try to make a meal of a tarantula, may have a little bit of trouble scaling the smooth vertical stems of bamboo. So compared to their ground dwelling or even arboreal relatives, Taxinus bambus is quite safe from many predators. And that is the end of this video. If you enjoy my content then feel free to check out some of my other uploads, hit that subscribe button and let me know what you thought in the comments. So thank you all very much for watching, that is it from me and I shall see you again very soon.